All right. Hi, everybody. I just started uh, going live on Facebook and going live inside Zoom. So we're going to see the uh, participants number begin to climb for a little bit. Please feel free to just take a moment for yourself and get, um, you know, get situated, get yourself some water, some tea, whatever you need. Um, and we'll get going here in one moment. Hmm. Okay, let's get rolling. So I'm excited to share that uh, today we are joined by William Much from Much Government Relations, and he is going to be um, helping to disseminate the uh, 2021 Colorado legislature and also, you know, the recent elections from an ECE context. Um, this is exciting. It's a little bit different iteration of this breakout webinar series. Um, based off of what is currently known, it might be a little bit shorter of a presentation. So that's why we please ask uh, that if you do have any questions throughout this, please just lob it in the chat as soon as you have it. Um, I'll be serving as our moderator for this. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with me, my name is Michael Taylor. I serve as Early Learning Ventures Outreach Manager and for today uh, as your chat, mo chat moderator. Um, please also feel free, if you are watching on Facebook, to um, basically post questions there. I have my teammate, Milena, who will be sending uh, the questions over to me. If you're unfamiliar with early learning ventures, I would be more than happy to meet with you and go into detail the work we do in Colorado and nationwide. Um, but to just briefly um, move ahead and, just, and introduce um, our guest speaker, as I mentioned, we're joined by William Much. He is the president at Much Government Relations. Um, he has basically been um, an advocate and a lobbyist in the early childhood space for several years now, um, but for ELV, for the Mirage Foundation, uh, for EPIC, if anybody is familiar with um, that organization. Um, so yeah, in a moment here, I am gonna be turning it over to him so that way he can be filling you in on what's going on. Um, before that, though, I do just want to ground you very briefly in some of the work that ELV is doing and some opportunities we have out there. Um, so we run the Colorado iteration of a national shared services resource platform. That thing is chock full of templates, forms, savings tools, um, uh, hiring tools, everything like that to help providers. Um, and it's free to all of you who are Colorado-based ECE folks. Um, so I'll make sure to include links on how to access this in some of the post-webinar messaging. Um, and then also, for those of you who currently use our system but might have been unaware, um, CORE, our child care management system, does have the capability for touchless sign-in and sign-out um, in order to, you know, make sure that you are being compliant with public health orders and just limiting, you know, contact of shared materials. We also have temperature and health checks built in. We'd be more than happy to uh, showcase that to you if you want to email or call our client support team. Finally, for uh, those of you who aren't providers, you know, maybe a stakeholder that's just trying to keep up to date with uh, what's going on in the ECE sector, um, my teammate, Milena, she does interviews every week with people in this field, sharing what's going on. Um, and we put out um, a whole bunch of useful content about what's going on in Colorado. So I'm going to stop it there because I don't want to take too long. I want to hand it back over to William since uh, he has most of the information that you showed up here today. So please, William, go ahead. Will do. No, it's sure a pleasure to, to be joining you all today. And uh, it's not something I always get to do in my world with uh, being sort of, you know, in, in, during normal times, the, the confines of the state capitol building are, are sort of my home. And uh, not able to participate in something like this. So it's a fun opportunity and experience and nice to be joining Michael and Melina and uh, all of you out there. So decided to put my tie on today. So I try to look a little more like my uh, professional photo that was out there. So uh, we've got a lot going on in this legislative world, really starting with the election. And uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm really hoping that we can have an interactive time together and get some questions and start a dialogue. I know that's difficult in this format, but uh, I feel like it's a lot more helpful than just uh, sort of overloading you with information and, and uh, sort of the inside baseball of the, of the state house and the legislative process. But for those of us that follow the legislature, 
uh, it's, everything basically begins and ends with the, the people that are in the building, who the leadership is. And so that's why we watch these elections so carefully, the, the partisan makeup of the, of the uh, General Assembly, uh, the kind of numbers between the parties, ha what kind of turnover we had from the election, things like that. And of course, us political junkies, we find all that you know, super interesting and follow every nuance. And so a lot of you may not be, uh, you know, wanting to dive into that kind of detail. So just sort of from a, from a really, uh, you know, that 20,000 foot level, pretty much a status quo election as far as the state house is concerned. So the, the Democrats have had a 17 uh, plus majority in the state house and they retained that even though uh, there were two changes as far as uh, partisan seats. So there was a, a Brie Buonteo seat in Pueblo West that was uh, tough to keep for the Democrats. That was more of a Republican leaning district and uh, Stephanie Luck picked that up. And then Richard Champion came in to, to fill a seat vacated by Susan Beckman in the Arapahoe County area. And then David Ortiz picked that up. So it was basically a one-to-one -one, uh, trade as far as the, the partisan makeup. And there will be new uh, leadership in the House. So there'll be a new speaker, Alec Garnett, with a new majority leader, uh, Janea Escar, when things come into place in uh, January. And then as far as a lot of the issues that we follow in the early childhood world, quite a few will be on the agenda of the Joint Budget Committee which is the budget writers for the legislature. And they also are uh, the, the, uh, the leads there are also either chairing and involved in the appropriations committee. So very uh, powerful members as far as moving that budget. So, and we've had some move in there where Representative Can Hansen, uh, Senator Hansen, sorry, has moved on to the budget committee in place of uh, Senator Zinzinger and Senator Moreno is taking over as the chair. Representative Ransom remains a member uh, for the House Republicans. And then we have Representative Herrick moving on as well as an appointee from the Democratic leadership, along with Representative McCluskey. And she's very key because she's been a fantastic champion of early childhood education issues. So having Representative McCluskey Remaining on the on the committee and as a, also a key sponsor of early childhood legislation is really a benefit to all of us who work these issues. So an, another sort of takeaway to keep in mind as far as the numbers of the House is that there's going to be 15 new House members who have never served in any kind of legislative capacity again. So uh, they've never served up there before. So those are going to be new members learning the process and uh, getting used to the legislature when they get sworn in in January. Uh, on the Senate side, the Democrats kept their, uh, actually increased their majority by one additional seat. So they now have a two seat majority, a changeover in Arapahoe County, a seat that the Republicans held to Senator Tate. And when Senator Tate actually decided not to run again, Suzanne Steyer went, went for that seat. On the Republican side, as well as Chris Colker, on the Democrats and the Democrats did prevail in that seat. So that does increase their majority by one. It takes 18 to have, to hold the Senate majority. So uh, there's now 20 seats on the Democrat side. So, and, and again, for those who follow that, just that just means those are strong majorities in, and especially in the House, very strong majorities on the Democrat side. They really, um, as much as things, a lot of our issues do get done in a bipartisan nature, and we always try to work on that. Uh, there's a tougher role on the Republican side. They just don't have the numbers. So it's basically building coalitions on the Democrat side and finding areas to work together. But the way that the rules are structured of the legislature, if, if the Democratic caucus gets together well organized, they can move the agenda really without working with the minority, which we, you know, it's, it uh, sort of moves back and forth how that works with the partisan flavor and depending on the issue, we don't see a lot of that in the early childhood side, but that's just kind of some of the, the nuts and bolts about how the process works up there. So 
Uh, and another thing we'll have is, is uh, we always have to look for who the new early childhood champions are gonna be. For example, Representative Jim Wilson was really one of the strongest voices on the Republican side in the House for early childhood. So ha not having him return the se session is a big loss. Uh, Owen Hill has been a champion. He's also moved off. He actually served a lot of times in the interim committee. So had a lot of changes. And another change that we've had is typically we would have had an interim committee working on early childhood issues throughout the summer and just concluding their work in October and already following a number of bills being introduced. So we don't have that this year uh, due to COVID and some of the budget cuts that the legislature had to make at the end of the last session as it recessed early. They basically uh, zeroed out the funding for all of those committees, including uh, the regular interim committee that works on early childhood issues. So not only don't, don't we have the bills, but then we don't have sort of that core group of members who've been in the, you know, in the loop, so to speak, all summer and into the fall following these issues, hearing from say uh, individual providers and stakeholders and other community partners where those members have been well briefed. So because of that, once we go back into session in January, wouldn't say that will necessarily be at a disadvantage, but it's just gonna be a different flavor or where uh, things will sort of have to, you know, we'll, we'll have to get the attention and, and do, some, uh, do some harder work on getting to know these new members and uh, also, again, finding out who really has this interest in uh, early childhood and uh, other official other issues that affect not only the providers, but also uh, some of the stakeholders. I understand we've got a good mix of community providers and other partners on uh, on this call today. So, yeah, um, William, I have a so a couple questions that came in during that initial part. Um, oh, great. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad we can interrupt this part and just. Perfect. Jump right in section by section. Yeah. So, um, you know, you mentioned 15 brand new legislature le legislators, and we did lose a couple that were very easy focused. Do you happen right. to know if any of the new legislators ran on a campaign that involved ECE at all? Like, are you, you know, are you looking forward to maybe picking up a couple people new coming in that, you know, have made this an issue for themselves? You know, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head where they um, really had ECE as a as a key issue. I'd say um, definitely workplace, you know, issues, um, uh, tough issues for you know when you have families working together, um, and you know you have uh, professionals in the household, and you need the childcare, and also with the COVID issue. But I don't recall anyone that had it more as a platform issue. And part of this is going back to this strange world we've been living in with COVID, where this is the first time I can ever remember. I've been doing this quite a while, where uh, I'm just not meeting face to face with people so often. And it's much more difficult to build these mm -hmm. kind of relationships that we would normally be doing. So some of this, you know, by getting onto a Zoom platform or talking on the phone instead of getting together for coffee or even maybe walking around their um, campaign district, meeting in their local coffee shop, sometimes being in people's homes when they're running for office. Uh, it's not unusual to be in, you know, someone's running first time for the legislature, you might spend an hour in there at their kitchen table with them or in the living room going through their campaign plan and, and uh, even meeting with their team afterwards. So this is a very strange world to really get our arms around. So again, for uh, for those of us that do this for a living, it's gonna be a little more work to identify those folks. And I'd say too, for the providers that are, that are out there, uh, the more that we can help you get connected to those, not only the new legislators, but the returning so that there's a direct connection at the provider level, they know what you do and they know the issues that are important, you can even help connect them with your clientele, with your families that are utilizing your services. Uh, that is, I know it takes a lot more work. To me, that's been a, a missing piece in what we do at the Capitol. And it's so much, it's just so helpful when people can be organized in that kind of a way <clears throat> to build that kind of personal relationship. 
And again, when they're looking for an agenda item, then they're hearing from you and they're hearing from uh, the families that really, you know, this is such a key issue. If you don't have quality care, uh, <clears throat> you may not be able to go to work and uh, impacting your family in other ways. So those are huge issues. And uh, the other one that I wanted to ask before moving on, is, so just um, a clarification around, um, you know, the bipartisan nature of ECE issues in Colorado. So this is an issue that tends to not fall on party lines. It tends to be something in Colorado where you do see teamwork between the various parties. Is that accurate? I would say, um, you know, the people, people up there really made, you know, I'd say it's sort of like majoring in different issues. There's, there's something that they're really passionate about. And so, uh, again, I think that a lot of that core group will come off of that interim committee or somebody when you're talking budget issues that affect ECE, take a representative McCluskey, for example, you know, if she already had that uh, interest in then being on the budget committee, just makes it all that much more of a, of a personal and a policy interest. So I, I do think there is a more difficult time on the Republican side, just because a lot of those members, it's frankly, the, the makeup of the legislature now is becoming, when I first started doing this in the late 90s at the State House, there are a lot more Republicans that were uh, coming from suburban communities and there were even members from uh, Denver Metro. That's changed a lot. There's a lot more rural members. So I think it's not, it's not necessarily a disinterest. There's maybe a feeling that it, it tends to be a little more of an urban issue at times as, as far as hearing from business constituencies and, and uh, parents. And, and maybe there's a feeling that in rural Colorado, things are taken care of a little better. I know Representative Wilson was an exception to that. But and then there's also a piece that you'll, that you'll see with more conservatives that they just have, um, there's uh, some concern just about the public sector um, taking over too much of, of what ought to be uh, more of a family decision with you know where they send their children to childcare. So um, sometimes some of those members are a bit skeptical that uh, maybe the, the public education side is gonna take the sector over or something like that. And as we get into the world after EE passing, we'll get a little more into that as well as a challenge that we have, at least that I see on that side of the aisle. Yeah, I actually, I don't know if you saw the question that just popped in, but I think it's a great question and it does involve EE. So if we want to just table it for later, but I just want to ask it since it came in. Uh, do you think the passage of an overwhelming support for Proposition EE will have an influence on how legislatures see early childhood education and voter interest in early childhood education? It sure may. I do think there's going to be interest uh, from both sides, especially with what the governor has said on mixed delivery. I think for, uh, you know, to be able to come in and work on basically a new policy. What should uh, the future of preschool really look like? What should early childhood that has this now public funding stream, what should that look like? That definitely interests me as well. I was able to be part of a forum actually last, uh, last summer where uh, the governor got together with some other leaders and uh, some coalitions from other states like Minnesota and Florida came in and talked about some of the work they had done Florida actually has, not Florida, but Minnesota has this amazing coalition all around their early childhood scholarships. And I don't believe it started with any, anything close to the kind of funding that uh, EE is bringing to the table. And then Florida has something similar. So again, I would think, you know, not only with the numbers of the passage, but the ability to really get this right and uh, break some new ground on something. Especially again, you know, when the governor talks about making sure and including uh, even faith-based and having the most robust mixed delivery system and really looking at the state preschool program, that's pretty interesting to a lot of a lot of members. I think to those on both sides that uh, not only um, limit their focus to education, 
But uh, I mean, not not to early childhood education, but education in general you should definitely find this interesting. So that's going to be some fun for us this next year. And again, a place I would urge that community providers that are logging in today to um, make sure they're really looped in so they, they understand what this implementing legislation is going to look like. They've been part of the community conversations and as this moves through that legislature in January that they're involved and are really comfortable with uh, what's being looked at, looked at on the mixed delivery side. Because clearly you want to make sure that the families that, are, that uh, have four-year-olds that are enrolled now are going to be able to continue to use their services in the future, should they desire. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting is you were talking about, you know, how some of the, um, you know, rural legislat legislatures tend to view ECE as more, um, you know, something that is a concern in urban areas. But when I'm looking at the providers that we have on today, I am seeing a lot of our, our rural community on. So just goes That's to show that, you know, got yeah. interest everywhere. <laughs> Go talk to your legislators. They know you're out there. Awesome. All right. Well, you know, I know I interrupted you, so I'm going to pop back on the sidelines and let you uh, get back into your flow. No, that's great. So uh, this works really well for me. And then uh, just talking about changing landscapes. And then earlier this week, now we learn we're going to be coming into special session right after Thanksgiving. So the governor now does have his call out. It's set for Monday, the 30th, 10 in the morning. What that convening looks like in COVID, we're not sure yet. How it's going to work for the lobbyists uh, <clears throat> and the public, we're still waiting to find out. As an example, at the end of the last session, after shutting down uh, for COVID and then coming back in, the public was really discouraged from being in the building. And uh, Basically, it was written testimony if you weren't going to show up, and, and there was still some public testimony, but I have to say very little. There are very few lobbyists up there. So it wasn't like they closed the building to the public. It was just uh, strongly discouraged and, and masks and sanitizer and really nowhere to sit, and just a whole different environment. And, and again, the biggest thing is the building sees I don't know what the exact number is, but on a, on any given day, I've heard numbers like a thousand people in and out of the in and out of the Capitol, and you've got hundreds of professional lobbyists and clients, and again, school kids and all kinds of things. So I know we're not going to see that. So we will see uh, exactly you know what this is going to be like, and especially what the public interaction is. And in me doing this professionally. Can't tell you how different it is when you don't have the public up there participating and you're involved in uh, difficult issues and, and how disconnected the legislators really feel, especially in committee, when they're not getting that input and they're not really sure where the public is and their constituency. So it's a, it's a uh, strange process, but important. Clearly with all of these shutdowns, there's been enormous economic consequences and definitely in the early childhood world. So I'm actually very happy that the, the call's coming through and there's gonna be the ability to work on this package. So if you didn't see as part of the governor's budget, he was talking some 45, 50 million in uh, assistance to early childhood care providers. And that was a, a previous program on getting grant dollars out, which uh, certainly applied to that. And uh, I had clients either urging the creation of that program or, uh, you know, really championing it and getting the word out. So we're very appreciative that that's on the agenda. So the call that's coming together basically is in uh, seven broad areas, eviction assistance and early childhood, uh, food equality, uh, utility assistance, trying to uh, broadband for children that are trying to go to school online, uh, of course, our early childhood issues. And I would assume that since the governor is talking about some $200 million being spent during the session, that, um, I, again, I, I have not heard the exact range for the early childhood assistance program, but I would imagine it's in that $45 million to $50 million range that 
the governor had already talked about as part of her, his uh, budget request. And instead of doing it in January, this will just advance it with the idea of, of getting these dollars out to the new providers much earlier who qualify. I think what that would help for me is as I read the call um, for those providers that are that are on, the assumption is that early childhood has taken like a 20% or greater um, financial impact as far as losing enrollment and uh, having a direct impact to revenue and, and really a hardship and being able to operate. So as, as much of that is going on in your world, it would it's really helpful for us in the building to hear those direct stories and also about how the current program has is working because when the legislation is drafted for some other clients and some of the assistance areas that are being talked about, one thing we're concerned about is making sure that uh, the dollars that are supposed to flow out are really, you know, that there's a there's a logical process and it's easy to apply and the dollars are really getting out to those people in need. So, and where there's stories about how things could be done better or um, maybe things are working well now, which hopefully that's the case. That's all going to be really helpful to us working on these issues for you. Yeah, and um, actually a question that came in uh, during that um, was, you know, we oftentimes hear, you know, go talk to your senators, go tell them what's going on for you, anything like that. Um, to that point, are there any ECE bills that, you know, we should be advocating for or keeping our pulse on uh, beyond, you know, what you talked about, about the funding maybe coming down? Right, so the, the way the special session works is you, it's really in the co confines of the call that the governor issues. So um, that limits the titles. That's sort of, you know, how you regulate how many bills can be introduced in the subject. So um, a special session has to take at least three days under the constitution, it takes you three days to pass a bill in Colorado. That's the fastest you can move something. So we know it'll be in at least that long and it's basically an extra charge on the taxpayers for every day though legislature is in out of a normal session. It's, uh, you know, obviously a special circumstance. So there's a real um, focused effort to make sure that the things that are introduced are really around the subject matter in the call. That's, that's how it works under the rules. So um, you can't put a lot of other things in, in that are not germane to, uh, to what the session is called for. And then, and then, of course, the leadership works to enforce that. So, but once they come back in January, there are other things that can be looked at. And, and again, I'll certainly um, be in the process and in, in, in the know with other things that come in under that uh, broad category of, uh, of the early childhood relief. So it's possible there could be, you know, one main bill that's funding or, or maybe some people look at other titles that are under that same uh, area. But the main things that are, there's things that are being talked about for when the legislature comes back in January. Uh, obviously, we have the, the, with the passage of EE, you've got the implementing legislation of what the early childhood uh, future program is going to look like. But we also have heard a lot from providers about barriers to their businesses, from building codes to zoning. There was le legislation last session that made sure that if you were operating in a neighborhood, your HOA couldn't prohibit a, uh, a, a child care business from operating. So these are sort of in the same uh, general area, I would say. So when you, you have an HOA that has an issue, and so um, if you have major problems in your community providing early childhood, you have a desert or you have just a, a basic uh, uh, deficiency in slots available, that's one more thing that you're facing when you're trying to meet that demand is if you're, you know, you're trying to have a, a neighborhood care center and it's prohibited right there in your HOA documents. So that's been one obstacle knocked down, but building codes and hearing sometimes zoning uh, are other major issues out there from providers. And I'm sure everyone from the stakeholder side and the provider side that's that's on can relate to that. No bigger issues out there in my experience from, from a local control side, not to go on too long, but 
done years and years of work for the building and development community. So uh, I fought a lot of those battles on uh, local land use issues where, you know, say you have builders and developers appealing to the state for some kind of relief because they, they don't feel like the local government system is working well in one or two jurisdictions or possibly more. Those are some of the toughest battles you can fight at the Capitol as far as uh, something that's not really, it's not partisan, it's more philosophical because Colorado is such a strong local control state. I've heard it said we're the second most local control legally structured state in the nation next to New Jersey. So having that number two, we have that tradition of home rule and, and again, building codes, land use authority, sort of nothing's more sacred to local government. So how, how you figure out exactly how to um, resolve those issues. And I think there's a lot of interest out there. It certainly isn't that people aren't sympathetic or that people on the local government side are not uh, sympathetic to early childhood, but that's gonna be a, a big issue for consideration. And we'll have to be carefully structured how you um, give some kind of authority to the state probably for licensing and uh, involve the local side and the health safety, or I'm not sure exactly what that is gonna look like, but uh, gonna be interesting policy ideas, but certainly major issues that, uh, you know, if you're trying to add a couple of additional children uh, as a provider, and you have the demand and then you get hit with some huge expense to retrofit your your home or your building just changes all the economics so how do we address that definitely have to figure that out thank you yeah i I've, I've, know i've been a i know i've been sorry about that <laughs> no i know i've no, I've been a part of several of those conversations with providers getting hit by building codes in the past. Um, but I do know, so on this call, we probably have a wide range of people's, you know, political knowledge um, or legislative knowledge, I guess. Um, so to drill in, straightforward question, detailed question. Um, are legislatures legislators able to get mail and answer calls or receive messages or is really email the best way to reach, um, you know, your local rep? You know, all the above is good. Um, they do definitely get the mail and read the mail and, and the emails and the calls. Frankly, they get, uh, during the session, there's just such an overload of information. I mean, that's really one of the main things that a professional lobbyist like me provides for clients is being there day to day, having those relationships and, uh, being able to ensure that I can find time with members by seeing them in person or uh, finding them on a, you know, a cell phone in the building or something like that and knowing schedules. And even then it's not easy. And I'll even hear from say somebody that's well politically connected to a individual legislator and they're having a hard time, you know, meeting with calls. And so a lot of that is just this information overload they have. So, it's where <clears throat> my advice is always the more you can, because uh, let's face it, there's no real, uh, maybe there's a perception out there that, you know, legislators come from on high somewhere and really most of them are, you know, regular citizens who might be in your neighborhood or, uh, you know, in, a, in the, your service club together or somewhere else where you can build the relationship locally especially when they're campaigning, there's that ability to, to volunteer and all of that. So the, the more people are able to do that, so you have some kind of uh, relationship so they recognize your name when you're, when you're checking in, you know, obviously that helps. And uh, I'm not talking about something like special access, just your normal networking and meeting people as business people and coalition partners in your community. But yes, once, once things get to the Capitol, uh, there, they are reading, you know, that information and taking it in, but just to keep in mind that, you know, they're on a real information overload because everybody else is doing the exact same thing. So if you're strategically trying to break through all that, I'm just trying to kind of give you some ideas of, of, uh, ways that you might try to, you know, 
break through the noise, so to speak. And um, with it being, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, has right. have of these ways to reach out to the legislators changed? I think maybe that, you know, the mail, the calling that was, you know, wanting to be framed within the context of the current situation. Is there a preferred contact method right now or is anything on the board? I went a little far afield there. Sorry about that, but shifted into, uh, I'm not sure, advocacy mode or something. But uh, I would say email tends to be in as much as you, um, a lot of members still check their phones at the Capitol. So, you know, leaving messages up there, but really during more of this interim period, email tends to be the most effective. And I hear from a lot of members that they'll have their, um, they'll have aids or other, other means of ensuring that their uh, email is getting forwarded. So they make sure and uh, get messages. So that tends to be effective as well. But, you know, nothing's more, nothing is that as effective as where you have that relationship. And if you have a, and some members will put it on their website, some members will put it in the directory where they have a personal number. And so when you have something that you really want to bring up and, and you feel comfortable sharing a story, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to uh, use that number to make your, make your views known. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, I think- You're welcome. Um, there are a couple smaller questions that are just on my end, but I feel I don't want to, you know, get off track. So if you want to just keep on going with where you're at in your notes. You know, I've kind of, I've covered most of it going through what we're expecting special session, this, uh, the legislative makeup and gotten into a couple good questions. So I think as much as there's other questions and discussion out there, this is the time for it. Okay, yeah. In that case, um, very generic, open question. Just what is a special session? Right, so, <clears throat> oh, this is fun. This is where I get to be like a, a political science professor, which would be fun. Um, so it's basically uh, the, the session, the regular session is set how many days, you know, in a normal world without emergency declarations in all the things we're living under now, you've got a certain set days that the legislature can meet and they must finish their business in that time frame. Colorado, it's 120 days, so you have that. But there is the ability of the governor to call the legislature back in if there is something extraordinary that happens outside that deadline. They have, they have the ability to come back work on a certain amount of issues that are under this, you know, the, the call that we talk about. And that's the purview of the governor to be able to, to bring them back in. So that's what he's doing. And hopefully that uh, answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what are some of the main dates that, um, you know, providers and ECE stakeholders should bear in mind for, you know, when the deluge of new information will come. Right, so I'd, I'd first be watching what happens with this special session and there, there may be outreach from organizations you're part of to, uh, again, we don't know what this is gonna look like, but in normal world, we'd be up there doing testimony and things like that. I doubt that's gonna happen. It's probably things in writing, emails to uh, members, things like that. So you're probably gonna be getting those asks I'd start looking for those around November 30th. After that, you know, how things came out, looking for the reports from people like me, from organizations that you're part of about how things turned out, how much money got into early childhood, early childhood assistance, how you access it. Another key date is going to be when things come back in January. And that session goes from January to early May. So I think it starts January 13th this year or something like that. Sorry, I don't have that right off the top of my head, but second Wednesday in January. And those that 120 day clock until May. Now, again, that's a normal world. Sorry to be so inside baseball. It's just, everything's so different now, but the, the process is currently working under an emergency order. There is 
an, an, you know, basically an opinion the legislature asked for from the state Supreme Court, which said it, under this extraordinary circumstance, the legislature can basically break from their business and come back, which they would never be able to do under a normal framework. So just to say this could be a strange one because like this last year with COVID cases, you know, as the big uncertainty, they might come in for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a few hours. I mean, who knows? And then take a break again to make sure and protect their members and keep the public from being in the building and not increasing the spread. So sort of uncharted territory. So that makes it a little diff more difficult to keep this timeline, but in general, you would be watching January to May. And then after May from your lobbyists, your association, your uh, organizations are part of to find out what happened and uh, how you succeeded and what the new policies are gonna be as a re result of that legislative action. Perfect, thank you. Um, so everybody who's uh, in attendance, if you have any other questions, please get them in now because this is the last one I have um, on my list that's coming. Um, so for those individuals that might not have, you know, an organization that they really like that tells them what's going on, do you have any like follow recs? Do you have a newsletter? What, how would you recommend somebody that wants to be informed, stay informed on these things? Right. Well, uh, the state does have a very good website for the general assembly and, uh, Michael, I did send the link out. So <clears throat> in any information that's going out. It's pretty good about being able to, you know, type, type in keywords and find legislation. Um, there's, uh, like I say, there's, there's folks like me around that, that know the process where, um, you know, you hit a wall. So, um, and uh, from being in groups like this, again, there might be folks to be able to help you with stuff like that, but in general, that website is pretty good. It has a, it has also a good directory of legislators and links to be able to email them. So to me, that's a great resource. If you're, uh, you know, without the professional representation up there, which obviously everybody's not able to do. So that is a, you know, that's a good way to stay informed. Um, there's other organizations like the children's campaign and, um, trying to think there's so many great early childhood organizations, including ELV that put out information after the session. Um, they all have professional lobbyists and get reports. So there is a good robust group of organizations out there that regularly update and send out action alerts and things like that. So I'm sure between all of us, for those interested, can make sure and loop you in to be on uh, one of those you know, help you subscribe to one of those email lists. So you're not just sort of out there at your mercy, trying to navigate the state website, which, which again is good, but uh, the direct information is better. Exactly, yeah. And um, I should have mentioned it, but I'll mention it now as we're closing up. So uh, here in about 30 to 40 minutes, everybody who registered uh, for this webinar will be receiving um, a basically post webinar message that will house a recording of this talk if there's anything you want to go back to. But it's also going to include um, five, five resources that William had sent over to us that he felt would be useful to um, providers and stakeholders, including that link to the General Assembly. So um, thank you so much for your time, William. It's really cool to get the inside baseball look, especially as somebody that really likes saber metrics like me. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Um, and we'll be sending out everything to everybody else. So thank you everybody for your time. Thank you. Great to join you today. Bye-bye. Have a good one, everybody.